We come to God's word this morning and we are confronted with the very threatening uh, idea here as we see the title, Deliver to Satan. When we see something like that, we kind of pause and uh, ask the question, what, what does that mean? Uh, now, we have uh, had the privilege of studying God's word in this wonderful book of 1 Corinthians. Uh, we uh, have encountered God's instructions, directions, encouragement. And we have uh, also confronted with uh, the serious warnings that have come directly to us uh, from the pages of the sacred text. Now, we understand and we believe that the key to spiritual growth and uh, our usefulness for the kingdom uh, of each individual uh, person before the Lord, as well as his church, is the development of biblical conviction and the pattern of uh, obedience to the biblical teachings. The power of God is at work in the hearts and lives of people who listen to him through his word with a teachable spirit and a willingness to obey. Nothing else replaces that connection. So the word came to us the last time uh, in chapter uh, 5 of uh, 1 Corinthians in the form of a very fearful warning that is shape up or shape out. And we remember that. Uh, and when Paul talked about that, he, he talked about the great sin in the church of Corinth. Uh, actually, there were two uh, great sins among many other sins. And the horrible sins of a man in immoral uh, relationship with his stepmother on an ongoing basis. But the uh, greater and more terrible, more horrible sin uh, in the church is that uh, the church tolerates that sin and proud of the fact of uh, the tolerance and uh, the so-called uh, liberty uh, of grace that uh, they uh, afford one another in the church. So Paul's instruction to the church uh, is clear and he demands that they repent of their sin of the unholy condition and attitude in the church that causes them not to be able to discern the seriousness of the sin among them. And that uh, the church uh, uh, excommunicate the sinful and unrepentant uh, member, the man who has committed this sin. Uh, Paul demands that he will be put out of the church, cut off from the fellowship as uh, Paul said in verse 2 to 5, he said, You have become arrogant and have not mourned instead, so that the one who had done this indeed would be removed from your, from your midst. For I, on my part, though absent in body but present in spirit, have already judged him who has so committed this, as though I were present in the name of our Lord Jesus, when you are assembled, and I with you in spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus, I have decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now we will concentrate on Paul's very significant and very solemn statement, deliver to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Now this perhaps is one of the least understood statements in, script, uh, in scriptures as well as one of the most frightening and alarming statements what does it mean to be delivered to Satan? What does it mean uh, uh, that God allowed this? Does God uh, uh, deliver his people uh, to Satan? How does he do that? And, and, and how can it po be possible? Uh, and so there's a lot of questions we have. What if this person is a Christian? What if he's not? And why is it going to ha uh, happen in this way? Now, all of these questions are legitimate, and we must know the answers because, uh, you know, I don't know about you, but the, the possibility that uh, I or anyone I know may have uh, influence over might be delivered to Satan. I certainly want to know the detail, especially when in the church, uh, I'm told that this is one of the function of the church, that we are to de uh, deliver certain people in the fellowship to Satan uh, uh, because of the the discipline of sin. I want to know the detail, wouldn't you? After all, it could be our neck, you know, your neck or my neck if we're not careful. So, uh, so we want to focus on this, but uh, it's much more important reason to learn what the Bible has to say in this area. Because the statement that Paul makes delivered to Satan gives a profound truth about God that we would never learn otherwise. Uh, it tells us about God, who he is, what he does, and uh, that beyond the capability of our you know, little minds. 
Uh, it reveals to us about our lives, our purpose, our meaning. It challenges uh, us uh, on our notion of happiness and priorities of, of life. It tells us about the spiritual warfare uh, in the light that uh, tends to be foreign to us. So we have tremendous uh, profound truth before us uh, by just this one statement. So what we're going to do this morning is uh, to go back uh, uh, to chapter 5 and uh, finish up what we uh, uh, didn't finish last week, which uh, was uh, the uh, solving the sin problem in the church. We dealt with the, the, the area of church must be holy, the, uh, the discipline must be decisive, and the root cause must be resolved. Uh, we will just do a quick review over that and go into the fourth point, that is the focus must be internal. And, and because it's, uh, it uh, laid out the groundwork for us to understand that we are protected from Satan, and therefore when we are delivered to Satan, uh, there's uh, an express action that God wants us to carry out. Then uh, we will look into the area of deliver godly man to Satan. Godly man, yes. We'll talk about that. Uh, and then the uh, delivery, uh, uh, the de uh, deliver ungodly man to Satan. Uh, we won't have time to do it this week, but uh, we'll uh, focus on that next week. So let's uh, turn to God uh, for prayer, ask him to lead us into his word. Lord, what a serious matter before us, and what an opportunity to go deep with you, to understand the deep truth, and, and see your purpose uh, in your sovereign will, working out in so mysterious way that beyond our imagination, but yet it gives us comfort and resolve to live for you and live uh, according to your will, so that whatever you want done in us and through us for your glory, you're free to do, to make us more like Christ and to bring glory to your name. So help us as we listen, help us to, as we process the truth and uh, form in us that desire to honor Christ by our own obedience. We thank you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So first, uh, let's just touch base on, uh, on the, the issue of the church must be holy when we deal with sins in the church. And that should be very obvious. Uh, Paul talked about uh, the reputation of the church in Corinth. And he said that uh, you are the church of God and uh, you, you are famous for immorality. You are famous for sexual immorality among you uh, as uh, something that even the pagan won't even do, uh, won't even dare to do. Now they sin on that, but they don't boast about it. They don't uh, talk about that with glee uh, like uh, you because you're proud about how you deal with the situation. So Paul called uh, the, uh, the Corinthian to task and tell them that, uh, that uh, that uh, the, the, their proud, uh, their pride is the, is the issue here because they put themselves beyond what is written. Uh, they're supposed to mourn. They're supposed to be uh, uh, in repentance and on their knees. You have become arrogant and have not mourned instead. Uh, they should have done that instead of being proud, but, uh, but they're not. And he said that had you done that, then, then you would be able to deal with the issue that uh, the one uh, who had done this would be removed from your midst, but uh, because you, d you did not repent, uh, you did not uh, have the ability or the power to uh, deal with sin in your life. And we must uh, understand that, that, uh, that uh, repentance and obedience uh, enable us uh, to deal with sin in, 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 in our lives, in our midst. And, and when the church is uh, unholy, it is the unholy of, uh, of everyone in the church, especially the, the, the one uh, furthest uh, from the work of the Holy Spirit. And then, uh, and then, uh, and then Paul, uh, Paul said that uh, you have to deal with sin decisively. Uh, the discipline must be decisive. Um, he said uh, the, the one who has done this deed will be removed from your midst. Uh, I, on my part, though absent in the body but present in spirit, have already judged him uh, so, uh, who has committed this as though I were present. In the name of our Lord Jesus, when you are assembled and I with you in spirit, with the power of the Lord Jesus, I have decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. He, uh, he called for decisive discipline. 
He said uh, the, the person must be excommunicated, must be removed from the midst of the church. Uh, so he said, you know, you have to take action. You can't just uh, uh, talk only. And, and uh, Paul took a very clear position uh, in this, very uh, definitive. And he said he has the authority of Christ. Uh, Christ is with him. Christ will be with the church as they carry out the, this uh, uh, removal of the sin uh, in their midst. Uh, and, 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 and he said, uh, you have uh, uh, the responsibility to deliver to Satan this person. And that's what uh, opened up uh, the door for us to think deeply on the subject of uh, uh, deliver to Satan for, for uh, destruction. Uh, but uh, Paul move on uh, to, 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 uh, to say that, uh, that the root cause of sin must be resolved. Uh, and he said, your boasting is not good. Uh, do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? Clean out the old leaven that so that you may be a new lump, just as you are in fact unleavened. For Christ our Passover also has been sacrificed. Therefore let us celebrate the feast not with old leaven, but with the leaven of, uh, not with the leaven of malice or wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Uh, so, so, so Paul said, uh, uh, you still have pride in the middle. Your pride is no good. Uh, you still operate uh, as uh, with yourself at the center, with yourself above the, the, the written text. Uh, and you leave yourself uh, uh, a little sin here, a little sin there. You tolerate sin in your midst. And you forget the principle of how sin works, and, and that is uh, uh, <clears throat> a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough. And so he pointed that out, and he pointed out how we need to understand that to deal with sin. You know, we have uh, a list of sin uh, that we like. Uh, we entertain uh, the, uh, the, you know, the uh, soft sin in our midst, and. Uh, we tolerate sins in our life because we like uh, the feeling, we like uh, the, the, the pleasure, we, we like what sin does for us. Uh, and we forget that if we tolerate a little sin, it becomes bigger sin. And it is not just staying in one corner and affect only that uh, area of our life. It begins to spread out everywhere and affect everything. And uh, just like a person gets sick, you know, start out with maybe a little uh, infection uh, uh, in the finger. It, la it go to the blood, it go to the brain, it go to everywhere, and the person is die or uh, incapacitated, incapacitated, uh, incapacitated. And that's what happened here. Uh, Paul is saying that uh, you leave a little sin in your life, it will leaven the whole body, and you will see the impact of that. Uh, so we are not to leave anything uh, or entertain any part of, of sin. Sin has to be deal with, uh, dealt with, with uh, the power of the cross, uh, with the atonement work of Christ, with the power of the sanctification of the Holy Spirit. Uh, but we are also uh, reminded that, uh, that things in the past life uh, cannot uh, have uh, room to uh, continue to impact uh, our, our current life the, that we are now before Christ. Uh, so he said, uh, clean out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, just as you are in fact leavened for Christ our Passover also has been sacrificed. Uh, he reminded the church that, uh, that just like the old, pe uh, the old people uh, of Israel in the uh, time past, that uh, they were delivered out of Egypt. And the Lord said, you don't bring anything from Egypt with you. You have to clean house. You have to make sure that the old leaven of Egypt is not going to be taken with you into the promised land, into your new life with, uh, uh, as the people of God. Uh, so Paul said, you got to get rid of anything that connects you to the past of sin, uh, uh, even people, even uh, relationship, even own habits. Uh, it's not something that we do by our, by our own effort, but we recognize this is the new nature that uh, all things become new uh, when we are born again in Christ and, and that the Holy Spirit will work this out in, into our life. And we have to have uh, discipline uh, to uh, uh, deal with the, uh, with the root cause uh, of sin and because uh, if not, then it's just like an old leaven. It's gonna ruin everything for us. 
And now Paul uh, moved to the last point when, when he said we have to be decisive about this. We have to be uh, uh, re uh, dealing with the root cause and it is the internal work uh, of the church. And the, uh, the, the people of the church that must be dealing with, we're not talking about people in the world. Uh, so he said in verse 9, I wrote you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. I did not at all mean with the immoral people of this world or with the, or with the covetous and swindlers or with idolaters, for then you would have to go out of the world. But actually I wrote you not to associate with any so-called brother if he is an immoral person, a covetous uh, or idolater, a reviler or a drunkard or swindler, uh, not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders do you not judge those who are within the church? But uh, those who are outside God's churches, remove the wicked man from among yourself. Uh, so this point is very simple, but it's very important. Paul said you deal with your inner spiritual condition. You deal with the situation of the church. Your focus is internal, in-house, clean house. You are responsible for uh, cleaning up your church. Uh, and don't worry about the world. Uh, Jesus will take care of the world when he returns, uh, but you have responsibility to deal with the holiness in the church. Uh, and I have written you in my letter not to deal with sexually immoral people. So uh, Paul said, this is not the first time we deal with this. Uh, he may remind them that he wrote a letter to them. Now this is uh, what we call the lost letter uh, uh, to the Corinthians. Paul uh, wrote a few, uh, more than two, uh, you know, the one that we have is First and Second Corinthians. He wrote more than that to them, but uh, uh, the, uh, the Holy Spirit uh, did not see fit to include those letters uh, in the scriptures, uh, but nevertheless it's part of their relationship. And uh, Paul already saw the problem in the church, and he instructed the people to live holy, separate out from the world and uh, disassociate themselves with immoral people. So the Corinthians uh, kind of mocking him, uh, you know, they reject him and they don't like what he has to say. So he said, how do you learn supposed to, to live in this world? Uh, because everyone we meet uh, in the street is immoral. Uh, everybody is immoral in Corinth. Uh, if that's the case, we have to go to the moon to live. And so Paul kind of play on that and he said, uh, I did not at all means with immoral people of this world uh, or with the covetous and uh, swindlers and adulterers, for then you would have to go out of this world. So he said, uh, yeah, I mean, if, if that's what I meant and you know that I didn't mean that, uh, because uh, if that's so, you have to uh, leave the earth and go on the moon. But you are on the earth and uh, you have to deal with the reality of your life in the, in the world and in the church. Uh, and he said, uh, uh, what I do not uh, uh, allow you to do is, is that you have to stop associating with immoral people among yourself. Uh, so, so, so here he said, uh, the, the, the key here to understand is the word to associate with. Uh, it's, uh, it means to mix up together uh, to mingle with, uh, to have uh, close uh, association, relationship with. Uh, and he uh, wanted to make that a very strong emphasis. So he said, really, you cannot do this. You have to understand and be sure that you don't do this. Uh, uh, you don't associate, you don't allow this happen. Uh, I wrote you before, uh, I, I am telling you now, uh, not uh, at any time, not uh, have anything to do with immoral people in your church. Uh, this is not something you want to mix up with them uh, because uh, if any way you mix up with them, uh, the impact on your life and on your church is uh, just uh, uh, untold harm that will happen. Uh, so they refuse to, uh, to uh, un understand that and, uh, and uh, he wants them to, uh, to walk away uh, of understanding the, uh, the truth here. And he said there's no exception in this one. Uh, you have to cut it out and you, you, you don't deal with immoral people, don't allow immoral people in your midst. Now Paul uh, said that even close friends and family members, uh, they have to be put out. 
uh, if he's a true believer, he will not lose his salvation. Uh, but uh, the pain of the excommunication may cause him to repent. And so Paul called for discipline of the church, and he has called that uh, in a far wider scope than we experience in our own church in, in the discipline that we apply uh, among our midst. Uh, in uh, Second Corinthians, uh, Th Thessalonians chapter 3, he said that in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we command you, brothers, to keep away from every brother who is idle and does not live according to the teaching you receive from us. He said those who, who are lazy, who are disobedient, uh, you know, the things that you may think is normal and, and, uh, and nothing to it. No, it's a serious matter, and, uh, and we don't want to encourage uh, any of such uh, behavior. So uh, I command you uh, to keep away from those brothers, uh, who is, uh, uh, from every brother who is idle and does not uh, live according to the teaching. Then in verse uh, 14, he said some more. He said, anyone who does not obey our instruction in this letter, take special note of him, do not associate with him in order that he might feel ashamed. He said, uh, anybody who is disobedient, yeah, you don't deal with them either. You don't uh, encourage them, you isolate them so that they can feel ashamed and repent. So, so what he is saying that you have to deal with sin and you have to deal with, with sin decisively and you have to deal with the sin in-house. Uh, and, and, and so uh, they, 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 they don't want to do that. So they say, well, um, uh, clearly you, we have to live in the world. And, and so uh, if we deal with the sin in the world, then, then we have nowhere to live. And he said that that's right. And so don't worry about the world. Uh, you have to live in the world. And, uh, and uh, God will uh, help you. Uh, in the relationship with the world, but you have to understand the nature of, the, of sin uh, in your midst. So, uh, so um, uh, clearly the Lord understands that we have to live in the world, and so in his prayer uh, to the Father in uh, John 17, the special prayer of the high priest of Jesus, uh, he said that I do not ask uh, you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. He prayed that uh, not... Uh, uh, that uh, the disciples be removed from the world, but that they live in the world, but uh, live uh, uh, out from, uh, away from the power of, of, of Satan. Uh, and, and, and here, uh, Paul uh, give the uh, summation of sin that is in the world in verse, uh, in verse 10 of, 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 of our text. He said, I did not at all mean with immoral people of this world, nor with the covetous and swindlers, or with adulterers. Uh, he he uh, he put the, the sin immorality uh, that the sin against uh, uh, our own body is uh, the sin uh, for self gratification. When he talk about uh, covetousness, uh, he talk about materialism, greed, and and things that uh, sin against others. And idolatry is the re replacement of God at the center of life by uh, created things uh, by ourselves. So he's talking about the sin of the world as sin against the body, sin against self, or sin against others, and then sin against God. Uh, so here we have uh, all the sin possible uh, sum up in this one uh, in the world that uh, they sin against self, sins against others, sin against God. Uh, and, uh, and he said those sins must not be found in the church. Uh, so when you live in the world, uh, our relationship uh, to the world has to be that uh, uh, it's not no contact because if no contact then, then like I said you have to go to another world to live you have to go to the moon to live and so there is to be contact but there is no conformity the church relationship to the world is, the, is uh, not no contact but it's no conformity so it's contact but no conformity in, uh, in the, the ministry of Jesus we, we saw that he uh, uh, spent a lot of time with drunkards and prostitutes and tax collectors and a lot of people who were despised uh, in the society and culture. Uh, and when confronted by the Pharisees, uh, he answered that uh, they that are sick need a physician, not they uh, that are well. Uh, in Mark uh, chapter 2, verse 17, uh, 15 to 17, 
uh, talking about uh, Jesus uh, hanging out in the house of uh, Levi. And while Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors, sinners, were eating with him and his disciples. For there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law were the Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, Why does he eat with the tax collector and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, It is not the healthy who need doctor, but sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. So we are not to avoid the world. Uh, we are to be in the middle of the world. Uh, we were to love the world, and, uh, uh, and uh, we are to be dealing with them, coming to them, uh, even uh, love them with the love of, uh, love of Christ, and to be with them uh, all we can in order to tell them uh, and win them for Christ. Uh, we're not to do what they do. We're not to conform uh, to their behavior or their value system, but uh, we contact them for Christ's sake. And that's what uh, Jesus uh, demanded of his people in Matthew 5, verse 13. You are the salt of the earth, but the salt, if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on the hill cannot be hidden. Neither do the people light a lamb and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So you are to get into the world, and you are to get your light shine in the world. You are to be in the middle of the system. Uh, you are to be contacting it, you uh, uh, up against it, you hear what it has uh, to say, know it's thinking, see what it's doing, and then win people out of it uh, and bring them to Christ in loving them with the love of Jesus without conforming to them. Uh, in, uh, in, in Philippians chapter 2, Paul made it very clear in verse 14, do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a, in a warped and crooked generation, then you will shine among them like stars in the sky. You will shine among them like stars in the sky. Uh, so, uh, so that's what we do with the world. Uh, but, uh, but when we deal with sin, we're not dealing with the sin in the world. Uh, uh, Paul said, uh, you proclaim the gospel to with them uh, to, to Christ, but you have to deal with the sin that is in the church, uh, verse 11. But actually, I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother if he is an immoral person or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. Uh, so, so, so he said, again, don't associate with them. Uh, I, uh, I tell you not, uh, not to... Uh, uh, stay away from the world, but you stay from your so-called brother who is uh, living uh, like the world. So he said uh, that, uh, that you do not tolerate sin. Uh, the, the, the tolerance of sin, that is the issue. The persistence uh, uh, in sin that calls for, for church discipline. And, uh, and every Christian uh, has to be in the process of sanctification uh, and uh, even though nobody is perfect while on earth uh, until Christ return, our life is not persistent in sin. Our life is not disobedience. Uh, and, and, and if somebody call themselves Christian but uh, live uh, uh, in sin, then they are not real brothers. So he said, those who bear the name in name only. Uh, and then he lists out the sin of the church. Uh, and it's very interesting, very instructive to look at that. So he said, the so-called brother, if he is an immoral person, a covetous, or an idolater, or a reviler, or a drunkard, or a swingler. Uh, uh, now, we don't know if he uh, really is a brother or not. He's uh, so-called, he called himself the brother. Uh, but, but, but he said, look at uh, the, uh, them. And, and we see the list here of sin in the church. He used the same list uh, uh, as uh, the sin in the world, but then he add two more, a reviler or, the, uh, or a drunkard. So the sin of the church is longer than the, uh, than the list of sin in the world. How terrible. Uh, and, 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 and so it's heartbreaking uh, to see that even uh, in this list, uh, 
uh, you, you find out that uh, every one of them is present uh, in the church of Corinth. Uh, if, if he said you're going to get rid of them who live in such a way, actually you have to get rid of the whole church. Uh, so uh, he make it very serious. He said that you don't even eat with such a, such a person. Uh, so Paul commanded that they not even uh, to eat with a person uh, as such, but uh, uh, have to cut fellowship, have to stop the connection, have to disassociate uh, and, uh, and bring the internal discipline to bear. Uh, so he said, uh, for what I have to do with judging outsiders, that's not my job. Uh, I here, uh, it's not Paul himself, but he, he, he's talking about uh, uh, himself as a, a, representation, uh, is a representative of the Christian community that the church have nothing to, uh, no business to, to judge the people outside the church because uh, Jesus will do that when he returns. God will judge the, the, those who are outside. His judgment is future, uh, and, uh, and uh, the church actually will participate in that judgment of the world. But uh, as we don't expect non-Christian to behave like Christian, we do expect Christian to behave like Christian. And so he said, uh, 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 what uh, have I to do with the church and outsiders? That's not my business, that's God's business. No, but I have to deal with uh, the, the people who are inside. You have to deal with the people who are inside your church. Uh, that is the uh, very uh, work that we have to do. Are you not to judge those who are inside? The answer is yes. Uh, we have to bring judgment. Uh, we have to bring concern. We have to bring action to deal with the sin that is in the church. So Paul is set, set, setting that up for us uh, to, to understand our responsibility, to understand that we have to be holy, we have to, to, uh, to deal with uh, sin in our midst uh, in a decisive way. We have to look into the root cause, uh, don't just uh, leave sin around or tolerate small sin and, and uh, sweep under the rug for the, uh, the things that uh, need to be resolved in repentance and uh, focus on the sin inside the church and not the sin outside. Uh, you know, we may go and uh, protest and, and uh, um, deal with the sin of the world, but then forget uh, the, the sin that's, uh, that's in us. Uh, and so when he said, when you deal with the sin uh, in, uh, in us, then I want you to be very decisive about, uh, about this sin. That, uh, that uh, when things are among you, then, uh, then uh, like the, the, sin, uh, the, the sinner among you, then I have decided to deliver such a one to Satan to the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we want to uh, move to uh, look into that, uh, uh, that uh, um, topic, uh, <laughs> deliver to Satan. But when we say deliver to Satan, we want to first deal with the protection from Satan because uh, the, here the initial thoughts concerning Paul's statement uh, the, the, for the man to be delivered to Satan for the destruction of the flesh means that uh, prior to that, uh, that being delivered to Satan, he was in a position uh, protected from Satan. And so we will see that, uh, that uh, that's the case. Uh, uh, and uh, the Bible will make clear to us that both godly men and ungodly men will be at point, one point or, the, or another for very different reason to be delivered to Satan. Uh, and, and, and so uh, what means before the action is uh, taken place, then, uh, then the person is protected from Satan. And uh, the God has purpose uh, uh, to bring uh, Satan into the picture and deliver his people uh, uh, to Satan uh, for a positive result, uh, for a positive reason. But there are also uh, cases where uh, delivery to Satan is purely uh, negative to inflict judgment and pain. Uh, and uh, so uh, um, uh, he wanted us to understand that. Let, let, let's just, uh, uh, so let me summarize a few words on who Satan is. It's a vast uh, uh, topic of, uh, of study, 
But uh, just to uh, have the uh, right understanding of, of, of how to deal with sin in the church, we want to know how Satan is involved. Now, Satan was created as a, an angelic being uh, of, of great glory. Uh, he is called Lucifer, the star of the morning, and he was one of the highest rank angels called the archangel, and he was in charge of the worship of God in heaven. We see that in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. Now, Lucifer sinned against God uh, when he rebelled and wanted to be worshipped like God. So he was in charge of worship, and that's the, like the biggest job in heaven because everybody in heaven is uh, for the purpose of worshiping God. And uh, when he uh, in charge of worship, he began to uh, want to be worshipped himself. He didn't want uh, God to have all the glory, and he wanted to uh, replace God uh, with himself. And so uh, God cast him out of heaven with one-third of the rebellious angels fallen with him. Uh, but God allows uh, uh, Satan to operate on the earth. Uh, and since the fall of man, uh, Satan has become the prince of the earth, taking over the function that God has given to, uh, to, uh, to Adam uh, to uh, govern uh, the, uh, the earth for him. So now Satan is called the enemy, the accuser, the prince of demons, the devil, the ancient serpent, the liar, the father of lies. Uh, he's called the murderer from the beginning, the prince of this world, god of this age, uh, the, tem the tempter, the ruler of the kingdom of the air. Uh, all that uh, to show that he is very powerful, very evil, very sinister, and he hates men and he hates Christians, and uh, above all, he hates God. He would do anything to make God look bad and to hurt him. Uh, so in the uh, uh, meantime, before the, the Lord returns, Satan is the temporary ruler of the world, uh, and uh, God see fit to let him uh, have power during this time, uh, and he has a lot of power over the unbelieving and unsaved world. We see that in uh, Ephesians 2, uh, verse 1 to 3. <clears throat> And you were dead in your trespasses and sin, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sense of disobedience. Among them we were to all formerly live in the lust of the flesh, indulging in the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. So Satan is the prince of the power of the air, Satan is the spirit that is now working in the sense of disobedience. And Jesus himself called Satan ruler of this world in John 12, 14, 16, three times. Uh, he's called ruler of the world by the Lord. Uh, Paul used very strong terms uh, to describe the power and, uh, and rules of Satan. Uh, we don't want to mess with him. Uh, of course, uh, Satan is nowhere to, uh, compared to God but we are nowhere compared to Satan. Satan is not somebody we want to mess with uh, on our own. Uh, on Ephesians 6:12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. So uh, power, uh, Satan has a lot of power, <clears throat> and men fear uh, Satan. Uh, the reason is that God has given Satan the power of death. A lot of us don't realize that, uh, but uh, 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 Satan is allowed to kill, and kill he does. Uh, this is the power that uh, Christ has destroyed and will fully take it back when he returns. But uh, Satan is allowed to kill with his power, and that's uh, what we see a lot in the world. Uh, People die for no reason and die needlessly and sometimes die in a very uh, horrible way. And we say, well, where is that coming from? It's coming from the devil. Uh, and, uh, and he has the power of death and, uh, and he holds people in fear of bondage. And so in Hebrew chapter 2, uh, to talk about that and show us that, uh, that we are no longer in fear of him. Because uh, he says, since the children have flesh and pl blood, he too share in their humanity so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death. So Christ died so that he can destroy the devil who has the power of death, that is the devil, and might free those who through fear of death 
were subject to slavery all their lives. So Satan can kill, and the fear of death uh, uh, um, leads people to fear Satan. And that's why people live in bondage of fear. Uh, uh, but Jesus has overcome death and took away the power of Satan. Uh, but anyhow, uh, God will allow uh, Satan to operate in this world. Uh, and, uh, and Satan then allowed to kill, uh, allowed to work evil. Uh, and uh, uh, he is in control of the world. First uh, John 5, uh, 19, we know that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. Uh, so uh, uh, we are trying to establish the fact that uh, uh, God protects uh, those who are his own. Uh, and therefore, when he delivered to Satan, he just removed the protection. And, uh, and then Satan can be free to act upon those who are delivered to him. Now, he cannot uh, act uh, uh, against believers uh, except when God allows him to. Because the Bible is very clear on this that, uh, that uh, those uh, who are uh, believers are protected by God. In John 17, uh, the, in the prayer of, of Jesus to the Father, again he pray, I have given them your word, and the word has hated them, for they are not of the word any more than I am of the word. My prayer is not that you take them out of the word, but that you protect them from the evil one. Uh, so he prayed for protection, and protection uh, is given to his, uh, to his people, uh, the believers. Now, Paul also said the same thing in uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, chapter 3, verse 3. The Lord is faithful. He will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. And uh, 1 John 5 tells us that uh, uh, anyone who is born of God does not continue to sin. The one who was born of God keeps him safe, and the evil one cannot harm him. We know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. So the, 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 evil, cannot, the evil one, the devil, the, uh, Satan cannot harm the Christian uh, because uh, we belong to God. But the whole world is under the control of Satan. Uh, now it's very interesting to know that the protection of God extends to those who are associated with uh, the believers. Uh, and and we, uh, we can see that in the story of so 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 Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, when, uh, when God revealed that uh, uh, the extent of uh, his willingness to uh, protect his people may uh, uh, extend the benefit uh, even to those who live to, uh, around them. It's a fascinating story. Uh, it's kind of long, but I think it's, it's opened up a lot of understanding uh, for us uh, concerning who God is and how he works. Uh, it, it should be clear that uh, this is not the case where Abraham bargains with God to be more gracious than he wants to be uh, because then uh, Abraham would know more than God. But it is the case where God uses the conversation with Abraham to reveal his gracious principle in operation and God will protect his own and the benefits uh, surrounding these people can be very massive. Genesis uh, 18, verse 20. And the Lord said, The outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah is in the great indeed, and their sin is exceedingly grave. I will go down now, and I will see uh, if they have done entirely according to this outcry, uh, which has come to me, and if not, I will know. Then the man turned away from there and went toward Sodom, where Abraham was still standing before the Lord. Abraham came near and said, Will you indeed sweep, uh, sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are 50 righteous uh, within the city. Will you indeed sweep it away and do not spare the place of the sick of the 50 righteous who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous and the wicked are treated alike. Far be it from you, shall not the church of all the earth do justly? So the Lord said, I, I will find Sodom 50 righteous within the city. Then I will spare the whole place for, on their account. And then Abraham said, uh, how about 45? He said, uh, I will not destroy if I find uh, 45 there. And uh, Abraham said again, suppose there are only 40. He said, I will not do it on account of the 40. How about uh, 30? 
I will not do it uh, if I find 30. He said, how about uh, 20? And then how about 10? And he said, I will not destroy on account of the 10. So to think about this, uh, this for the sake of uh, only 10 believers, God will spare the whole city of gross sinners. Thousands and thousands of people might be benefit from the protection of God. In this case, uh, the withholding of judgment because there are a few believers who live among them. For Sodom and Gomorrah, if there were 10 believers there to save them, uh, well, there weren't uh, enough uh, to save them, but the principle of God, uh, gracious protection is very clear. Now, the same principle work at home uh, as well as in the church. Uh, we want to establish this because people who live in the home and in the church uh, around uh, believers uh, uh, enjoy the protection. Sometimes they presume on it, but the scripture tells us that there is. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 14 For the unbelieving husband has been sanctified through his wife, and the unbelieving wife has been sanctified through her believing husband. Otherwise, your children would uh, be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. Now, being sanctified here is uh, on the, uh, you know, the basic sense of being separated out. They're not saved or made holy uh, uh, as such, but they are included in the, uh, they are included in the protection of God for the spouse or for the parents, uh, and they, uh, and uh, the, because of the believers in the home, the whole house is protected. Uh, so this is why some people like to hang around the church and the church people, even though they don't commit to Christ because of the blessing that they can share. Uh, so, so that to establish that, that so uh, we, we are protected from Satan and to deliver, to be delivered to Satan is when God decided to remove that protection or to uh, put us outside of the umbrella of his protection. Uh, first, we want to uh, note that, uh, that godly man can be delivered to Satan. Um, <clears throat> the concept of delivery to Satan is, uh, again, to remove the, the, the protection that God has over his people. And we don't think that ever happened to godly man. We assume that it's always there, that uh, God's uh, protection is constant. But we'll be surprised by the truth uh, from Scripture that God in his, in his infinite wisdom for his eternal purpose and for our, our highest good will at times deliver his very own faithful people in the hand of Satan to accomplish his will. Uh, so in his sovereignty, God will have our highest good in focus uh, and his will for us is good. But the way he brings about his wonderful will and purpose in our lives may include delivering us to Satan for positive result, even though it not uh, seem very positive as we go through it. Uh, so we look into the purpose of what God is doing. So for uh, uh, delivering godly man to Satan, we know that number one is uh, to know God more uh, for, uh, for the purpose of knowing God. Number two is for the purpose of revelation. And number three, for the purpose of ministry. I, I don't think that I have, we have time to cover just uh, uh, point one, maybe in point one, uh, part one. Uh, that is uh, for the purpose of knowing God. That uh, God deliver godly man to Satan for the purpose of knowing God. The purpose of knowing God is the highest uh, purpose of man. Uh, the Westminster Catechism uh, states in terms of a question, uh, what is the chief end of man? Answer, to know God and to enjoy him forever. If that is the chief end, the highest goal of man, and it is, then nothing is too much to achieve that ultimate purpose. Knowing God, knowing his person, knowing his truth, knowing things that he wants us to know and enjoy him, to live in a relationship and fellowship with him forever is the highest good, is the most uh, wonderful thing for a man. So even at the price of temporary hardship, even terrible hardship, we need to understand that God will work this out. Now, uh, I'll look into uh, different uh, cases, and we will have time to look in the case of Job this morning for the purpose of knowing God. The story of Job illustrates the perfect uh, uh, 
purpose of God uh, and the method God used uh, to bring a man into uh, that depth of relationship with him. Uh, some of us know the story, but uh, let me just start out with saying that uh, Job was a very godly man. He was the best of men. He was upright. He was God-fearing. He was God-worshipping uh, person. Uh, but in uh, Job uh, chapter 1, uh, in verse 6, uh, the story begins to say that one day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord from roaming uh, through the earth and going back and forth in it. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Does God fear God for nothing, Satan replied? Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed his work, uh, the work of his hands, so that his flocks and his herds are spread out throughout the land. But stretch your hand and uh, strike everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Very well, then everything he has is in your hand, but the man himself do not lay a finger and Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Now we note the point that it is God who made the initiative, who took the initiative and brought up the matter of Job before Satan. God said, you know, look at the guy. Um, you should uh, look at him and, and uh, uh, kind of give the invitation to Satan to deal with Job. And so Satan went for it. And he said, you know, of course, he, uh, he's good. He's not stupid. He knows where the good stuff comes from. Uh, does God fear God for nothing? No way. Nobody fear God for nothing. Uh, Job is a practical guy. He's a pragmatist. Uh, so you bless him. He, you protect him. You loaded him up. Of course, he loves you and worship you, but uh, just try to take his stuff away and you see if he has true faith or not. So the central question here is uh, the fact that uh, that faith uh, is true faith based on blessing our unpersonal relationship with God? That is the question. Does Job fear God for nothing? What is the nature of true faith? Uh, is it uh, in God alone and for God alone? Uh, and so here we have uh, the question, the challenge, uh, that uh, the, the true faith is in God alone and for God alone. And God wants to make this point exceedingly clear uh, about the nature of true faith and the relationship uh, with him that is based on, uh, not on anything else, but uh, God himself. Anything other than that is not true faith. So he picked the, his best servant, Job, and sent him out to proclaim the, this truth in the way that even Job didn't know, but uh, he, uh, that he has to uh, deliver this message not by word, but by his very own life. So God delivered Job to Satan. He removed his protection from everything that Job had. Only he continued to protect, uh, protect uh, Job's life. And, and so we, we, we see that description uh, in uh, verse 13. One day when Job's son and daughters were feasting and drinking wine in the oldest brother's house, the messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys were gazing nearby. And so this uh, Sabians attacked and carried them off. And they put the servant to sword, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. So one disaster to the, to the next. While he's still speaking, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, another messenger came and said, The fire of God fell from the sky and burned up the sheep and the servants, and I'm the only one who has escaped to tell you. And while he's still uh, speaking, the Chaldeans formed three raiding parties and swept down on their camels and carried them off. They put the servant to sweat, and I, the only one uh, who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, yet another messenger came and said, Your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking at the oldest brother's house. Then suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house. It collapsed on them, and they are dead. And I'm the only one who has escaped to tell you. So in one swell scoop, uh, Job lost everything. Uh, you may see that uh, Satan works through many different agencies. He uh, used evil men, he used wildfires, he used uh, uh, sandstorm, uh, and uh, so he kills uh, the job children, 
and he took uh, all the Job possession. Uh, so what did Job do? Will he deliver the message of true faith? Will he answer the challenge uh, raised against God that uh, uh, does Job fear God for nothing? Uh, and, um, and so uh, here uh, uh, the answer is that yes. Uh, at this, Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head, and he fell to the ground in worship and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. And the Lord gave, and the Lord uh, taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. And in all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. Uh, so we have here the, uh, the, the, the case that, uh, that Job is given the opportunity to defend the truth uh, concerning God. And we know that, uh, uh, that the, the truth of true faith is that faith is in God alone and for God alone. Uh, and uh, God wants uh, to communicate this truth to the whole universe. And uh, he sent Job to do it. But God is not through yet. He, he brought up the matter again, as we know the story. Uh, and he talked to uh, Satan again. And, uh, and, uh, and, and, and so we, we may say to God, why don't you just leave the guy alone? Uh, but uh, we miss the context. Uh, because, uh, you know, say in a country, a president uh, uh, can send troops in harm ways to protect the country and uphold the freedom. Now, uh, we don't question the president when he does that, but uh, we question God, why he would send his people into hardship, um, because we don't see that the truth of God uh, is worthy to defend, to uphold, and to die for. But it is more than anything else. And so here God is sending Job uh, into the battle again, into the war again, uh, to proclaim uh, this truth that uh, relationship with God is uh, worth more than life. In chapter 2, uh, same, uh, same uh, conversation. I won't uh, read the detail, but uh, 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 God said, uh, look at Job. Uh, you know, you, uh, you almost, uh, well, you took everything from him. Uh, and Satan said, skin for skin. A man will give all he has for his own life, but stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and bone, and he will surely curse you to, face, to your face. And God said, okay, go for it. Uh, just observe the limits uh, that I put on him. Uh, so God narrows down the limit. Uh, Satan can touch uh, Job's body. He just cannot kill him. Uh, and, and so he, uh, he struck him with a painful sore from the sole of his feet to the top of his head. Uh, now it's so terrible that uh, his wife would say to him, are you still holding on to your integrity? Curse God and die. And the, and the famous line, he, uh, he, he said, uh, you are talking like a foolish woman. Oh, no, that's not the famous, uh, the, uh, the famous line. The famous line is that, shall we accept good from God and not trouble? Uh, uh, and Job did not sin uh, in what he said. What, what, what we see here is that, uh, is that uh, 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 God is working out uh, the transformation of Job life uh, uh, through the hardship and through the pain. Um, and he's making a drastic point uh, with, the, with the, uh, the use of Job. But, uh, uh, but we know that uh, soldiers serve the master uh, and uh, so give their lives for the country. And so for, for, for God, uh, uh, God has uh, Job highest good in his mind. And uh, for God's purpose uh, of glory, that means the highest good uh, for Job, uh, even uh, when he goes through the difficulty uh, at, the, at the current time. So Job really struggled with what happened to him. He wanted to know why, and he, uh, uh, that, uh, he said that if I just know the reason why I could tell anything, even if you slay me, uh, I will still trust you. He said that in uh, chapter 13. Uh, uh, but, uh, but God continued to be silent, uh, not a word, not an explanation uh, for a long time. And, uh, and the problem with, with Job is that, you know, he wants to know, but uh, the fact that, uh, that if he knows, then there's no more test. Uh, the fact that, uh, that he is faithful when he doesn't know, that, uh, that he stays with true faith, uh, even though the benefits of that is not very clear. And so, uh, so... 
And that is uh, that is uh, the journey that uh, God is bringing Job to deeper understanding uh, of the truth concerning uh, who God is, how He works, uh, what's important to Him, uh, what's uh, 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 worthy of sacrifice uh, for His name's sake. Uh, so, so uh, Job was a good man. He was the best of men, but uh, God wants uh, to make him better. I want to transform him from, from within. And so uh, one day, uh, Job, uh, God spoke to Job, and he, he did not give him the answer. He just said, here I am. So uh, in uh, Job 38, the Lord answered Job out of the storm, and he said, who is this darkness? My counsel with words without knowledge. Praise yourself like a man, I will question you, and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand who marked up its dimensions. Surely you know who stretched uh, a, measure, a measuring line across it. So, so basically God is saying that, uh, uh, Job, uh, you know who God is. You know who's the sovereign uh, over all. You know who's the creator. You know who is man. And so uh, for chapter 38 to 41, God uh, show the creation work, God show the power, the mystery of the universe, the unknown uh, the death of the creation. And so he said to, to Job, the answer to you, everything in your life is this, I am God, I am the sovereign God, and that should be sufficient for you. And Job's reaction is very clear. And Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do all things. No plan of yours can be thwarted. Uh, who is this that obscures uh, my counsel without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. Uh, uh, listen now and I will speak, I will question you and you shall answer me. My ear has heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Job said, I'm sorry, Lord, I spoke too soon. I don't know what I'm talking about. You know, I'm like the private in the army, I'm doing my job, but then I question the uh, commander-in-chief uh, uh, and I demand a, a, an explanation of why he sent me into, uh, into the mission. Uh, but uh, now Job understands that something is missing uh, in the understanding uh, uh, of the private uh, uh, life uh, here uh, on the basic foundation of military service, the chain of command. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, he understands that, uh, that, uh, that God is sovereign and uh, he discovered sin in his life that he didn't know that he had before. He discovered that his view of God was too limited, is too narrow, is too egocentric. Uh, he began to see that even though he has saving faith and he can stand uh, the ground as well as anybody because of his love for God, but God is much greater than he ever known much more mysterious, much more awesome than he can ever imagine. So he said, my ears have heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. So Job repented. He now knows something uh, more of God than before and more of himself than before. And uh, uh, all that happened because he was delivered to Satan. Now, if you ask Job if the price for that knowledge of God is worth the suffering, he would say yes. He would agree with the wisdom of God uh, on 2020 high side. Now, when he was going through that, he didn't think so very much. But uh, uh, after Job had prayed for his friend, uh, chapter 42, the Lord made him prosperous again and gave him twice as much as he had before. And the conclusion is that Job lived 140 years. He saw his children and his uh, children to the fourth generation, and so he died old and full of years. So here's the case of uh, a massive uh, uh, truth uh, that God wants to reveal himself and the truth concerning himself. Uh, he wants to reveal that saving faith is eternal in God alone and for God alone. It does not depend on circumstances. It's more, than, uh, it's more important than life itself. Uh, that uh, the truth concerning God uh, is worthy uh, for his people to defend, uh, to proclaim, 
uh, even at the cost of life and cost of blood and cost of suffering and pain because uh, it's uh, the worthiness of God's name and the worthiness of uh, his glory uh, is the driving force uh, in the life of his people that it is uh, the highest good for them uh, to know God and to live uh, in fellowship with God. And so God sent a good and godly man, a righteous man, a strong man to the stronghold of Satan and showered out at the top of his lung and his life uh, that uh, saving faith is eternal in God alone, for God alone, that uh, yes, men will worship God just because they know God. Uh, but uh, but uh, even though it is a message worth delivering for the glory of God, uh, we also know that the man himself, Job himself, is in, in the process to become a better man, more holy, more blessed, more faithful, more in love with God because he has delivered, uh, because he has been delivered to Satan by God himself for God's purpose. Now I'm out, I'm out of time, so uh, we just uh, stop here and we will look into the rest of the lesson uh, in, the, uh, in the next time. Uh, we look at uh, deliver to Satan uh, and look at the deliver uh, of the godly man to Satan for the purpose of knowing God, purpose of revelation, and purpose of ministry. And we will look uh, the, to the deliver of uh, ungodly man to Satan for the purpose of discipline of sin, for the purpose of, of stopping uh, bad examples, and for the purpose of termination of grace. Just, uh, just uh, penetrating truth and, uh, uh, and very instructive. It uh, takes us to, into the depth of understanding of God. But for the lesson uh, that we encounter today, let's uh, ask ourselves these questions. As we talk about the church uh, uh, being holy, and uh, that we deal with uh, the sin in the church and in our own life uh, decisively, that we have to deal with the root cause, and uh, that we are responsible for the internal condition of, uh, of the church. Uh, uh, and we look at the process that God uh, um, may use Satan uh, to purify his people. Uh, God may uh, use Satan uh, to bring uh, judgment and discipline into the life uh, people in the church or even purge out people who uh, thought they were in the church, belong to the church, but actually not uh, true believers, and uh, they will be found out and uh, as God deliver them to Satan. So, uh, so we want to ask the, the, this question as, uh, as for, for us, uh, when we are uh, suffering for, for God, uh, because God has taken us into a deeper connection with him, deeper understanding of him. Uh, even when he delivers us uh, to Satan, we want to uh, remember the example of, of Job, uh, that, uh, that uh, he is sovereign, God is sovereign. He is all, all good and all things work together for those who love him, for the highest good that God uh, will, be, uh, will give to uh, to those who belong to him for his glory. So we rest in that with uh, peace and with certainty and with dependency on God. But we are reminded that uh, that, uh, the, that kind of life has to be cleansed of sin. Uh, the, the life that can proclaim God's name has to be disciplined in holiness so that uh, God can use that uh, life for God himself, for his glory. Uh, and then we will look at, uh, for, for those who are ungodly, what a terrible thing when uh, they are delivered to Satan. But uh, turn our heart to God and, and uh, ask that whatever situation that we will face, uh, we will deal with sin in repentance, uh, in total reliance uh, from God's provision in Christ, and that whatever happened in our life, we will uh, surrender totally uh, to God and his glory and his sovereign plan. A lot, there's uh, so many other aspects of uh, the lesson that we are just uh, longing to dwell in. But uh, this morning as we are confronted with your truth, 
uh, we are reminded of uh, the sin that is in us, in, in our family, in, in our church, that you want us to remove decisively, that we want to get to the root cause of it, remove all the uh, leaven so that uh, uh, nothing is left behind that can leaven up the whole lump uh, in uh, the old uh, leaven of Egypt. But we are uh, already delivered by the power of the Passover lamb that has been sacrificed, that we are cleansed of sin so that uh, we can live uh, uh, with the victory over sin and free of the power of sin. And we, uh, we walk that way when we understand that uh, you are sovereign and you can give circumstances in this particular lesson, even Satan, uh, to bring us into deeper knowledge of you uh, as uh, we see in the case of Job. We pray that uh, you will guide us uh, in uh, whatever situation we face in our life right now with the understanding of surrender fully, uh, totally to you for your purpose and for your glory so that we can be uh, deeper in understanding of your truth, deeper in the life for you and more effective for the work of your kingdom. So work your truth in us, transform us for your glory and for your honor and for our, for our highest good. We thank you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.